Welcome back to our discussion of neural language models, where Mohit is teaching us about what BERT can and cannot do. We're continuing our discussion by talking about what properties BERT seems to capture and whether BERT needs to be so darn big. We should note that most of the insights in this video come from Anna Rogers, who has a lovely series of papers on the subject, which is linked in the description. All the errors in this video, however, come from me. So what's BERTology? Sometimes it feels like BERT is a piece of forgotten technology from an advanced civilization that we picked up. It seems to work really well, but we don't always understand why. There have been a series of papers by researchers who take BERT's supremacy as a given and try to peer inside its inscrutable transformers to try to understand what it's doing. This line of research has taken on the name of BERTology, the study of BERT for BERT's sake. Which doesn't make a lot of sense from a Muppet perspective. It was Ernie uh, who was the crazy and inscrutable one, and Bert tried to figure out what he was doing and failed most of the time. So what are some of the things that Bert seems to know? Lou et al. showed that some Bert heads seem to know what the part of speech of words are. How did they figure that out? They built a classifier called a probe to predict the part of speech, and using the output of individual heads as input to the classifier, they could predict the part of speech. But that's a word level feature. Even if it's doing better than word to vec you could probably do pretty well with non-contextual embeddings. Does Bert know anything about phrases? Yes, it seems to. Lynn et al. showed that it can also figure out which of the verbs are the main auxiliary verb. <clears throat> well, but learning a classifier with a large enough dimensionality still seems kind of unimpressive. Does the space actually mean anything? Hewitt et al. created a linear transformation of BERT representations that, if you then ran a minimum spanning tree over the resulting representation, could create a parse tree. Okay, but can it correct my grammar? Yes, uh, Goldberg showed that it can correct your grammar. BERT has higher probability for the correct choice across a variety of constructions. Okay, so it seems to understand syntax. Does it know what words mean? Yes, and it seems that it has some world knowledge too. For instance, it can complete triples from a knowledge base like where was Dante born? And even when it's wrong, the answers are just as reasonable as the correct answers mined from ConceptNet. Well, we should be suspicious of any language model that doesn't complete you should celebrate because you are with studying computational linguistics. Fair enough. Is there anything that it can't do? Uh, does it know common sense? That does seem to be a problem. For instance, it cannot infer that if x can walk inside y, then x has to be smaller than y. Let's go back to syntax. Are there any cases where it can't fill in the blank? Edinger et al., uh, another Maryland grad, I should add, showed that it doesn't understand negations. If you ask it to fill in the blank of a robin is an x, the an answers look good-ish. If you ask it to fill in a robin is not an x, it does much worse. Is this because of the way that BERT is trained with masking out individual words? Perhaps. Uh, BERT seems to be fairly indifferent when you leave out words in a sentence um, in BERT base, but not BERT large. Uh, what about numerical reasoning? What does BERT know about numbers? There it's a mixed bag. It seems that it can usually figure out when numbers are bigger than each other, but it struggles with argmaxes or finding superlatives. Although it can sometimes do things like add or multiply numbers, whether it can seems to depend on how you encode the numbers. Spelling numbers out seems to be worse than writing them numerically. I should point out that the co-first author of this paper is also a former Maryland student. I advised Eric Wallace. It seems that BERT can do quite a bit, uh, but there's still some room for improvement. How do you know which heads are doing interesting things? Kovaleva et al. show that many BERT heads are essentially just repackaging pre-training information based on their attention patterns. But the heads that aggregate information from all over or from specific places in the input seem to be doing more interesting things. Okay, so if many of the heads aren't doing much that's interesting, does BERT need to be so darn big to do well? 
No, and this connects to recent work about more generally understanding neural networks. You might have heard of Hugging Face, a company whose products make life infinitely easier for NLP researchers who want to work with large language models. Their Distilbert is 40% smaller, 60% faster, but 97% as good as the original model. How do they do it? Is it still a BERT model? Yes, but it only has half the number of layers, initializing the smaller model with half of the original parameters. But how do you train it? Is it on the original task? Yes, but rather than just trying to get the label right, the goal is to match the original model's output distribution. Do these smaller models then just overfit to the training data? No, they still seem to generalize. Michelle et al. selects heads by the size of their gradients and shows that you can throw most of them out at test time without too much difficulty. Just like in backpropagation, the larger the gradient, the more important the head is to whatever answer you're going to get. So you average over the inputs and find the ones that have the smallest absolute value of the gradient and throw them out. And a recent paper by Prasanna, Rogers, and Rubenshisky show that even when you prune heads directly for a single task, you can still do well on related tasks. And are the models still half the size? No, they're even smaller, around a tenth to a quarter of the size in the best cases. Um, cool. So does this aggressive pruning always work? No, sometimes it doesn't even do better than an ELMO baseline, but when it does work, it works really well. So does this pruning or distilling save just the interesting heads from the Kovaleva paper that you mentioned before? Yes. Uh, Voita et al. classify the heads that stay around after pruning, and the heads whose attention patterns look more syntactic stick around longer. All right. Uh, well, that's kind of satisfying. Uh, and for question answering, an area that we both worked on, the results of the efficient QA competition uh, we ran in 2020 seemed to show that to get truly, truly tiny models on the order of megabytes, uh, you can't really use BERT even if it's really finely distilled. Uh, you have to handcraft a new model for the task. Uh, there's a link to the videos for that competition in the description. So is the moral of the story still that BERT works for some things and not others, but we don't really know why? So as we record this in 2021, what interesting things remain on the horizon for improving our understanding? The size of the models really are a problem. While you can distill or prune a model after it's trained, you seem to need a lot of capacity for training. So hopefully we can do better at training more efficiently. Another way of improving training is matching the architecture of the computers and chips that we train on. There is a lot of exciting research out of NVIDIA, Apple, and Google about making sure those things match. Apart from engineering, where do you think we can improve models? One of their biggest shortcomings remains that they're only trained on text data. Despite all of the claims of superhuman ability, Humans learn their view of the world from rich groundings of objects that they can see, touch, hear, and smell. Yeah, uh, Bert without a nose does seem odd now that you mention it. Is it okay to trust important applications of models that we don't yet understand? I think that's a question of equal importance to the technical challenges here. These models memorize a lot of information and use them to do some really cool applications. However, using this power responsibly, ethically, and legally is often as inscrutable as their underlying attention patterns. Thanks again, Mohit, for uh, helping us understand these neural language models as much as we can at the moment. If you want to see more videos like this, check the video description for the course that comes from the link down below. You can then see the context and the correct order for watching these videos. YouTube will gleefully show you stuff in the wrong order. If you want other people to see this video, provide a big gradient to the recommendation algorithm by clicking the like and subscribe button down below.